All right, so first of all, thank you everybody for um, joining us this evening. Um, I hope wherever you, you are in the world, you're very safe. Um, it's very nice of you to give up a perfectly serviceable bank holiday Sunday to come and speak with me and Alistair. I realize we're clashing with country file as well, which is uh, never a good idea, but you've made the right choice this evening. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name's Rhys. I'm a lecturer in biomedical science at the University of Sussex. And just to declare an interest right at the start, I am also a previous stem cell donor. So I am naturally coming to this more biased, more positive about stem cell donation, and hopefully, you know, sort of hope to plug the message and uh, get a few more people on board. Um, another disclaimer to add is that I'm doing this from home, um, as we all are at the moment trying to do our jobs from home. So um, if the Wi Fi drops out or you hear dogs barking, doorbells going, kids beating each other up, um, I apologise in advance. Uh, hopefully we can work our way through it. Um, just a bit of Zoom housekeeping. I don't know how good all of you are with Zoom. Um, I've been learning as we've been going really. Um, but down on the bottom of the screen there's, uh, you should see a chat bar icon. So you're all on mute and I'd like you to stay on mute if that's okay, just so it doesn't interrupt me and sort of Alistair's flow. But also there's a chat bar down the bottom. So if there's any problems, if, if the signal drops out or if you can't hear us properly, do type on there. And also do save up any questions as well for the chat bar because um, uh, at the end we'll do a bit of a, a Q&A with Alistair and, and ask him any questions that you might have about stem cell donation, um, the process, or if it's me, the science involved as well. Um, so... How are we going to do this is we're going to, just to give you an idea, I mean, I normally do this with my undergraduates um, in a lecture theatre just because it's really important. Universities are superb recruiting grounds for stem cell donors because you have young people who will, will come on to the reasons why young people are good for the register, but you also have mixed, very mixed ethnicities on campus, which is really good for problematic tissue matching. Um, so this would have been done in a lecture format. Um, but, you know, since we've all gone under lockdown, um, I thought, well, we can do it over Zoom and, and why not open it up to, to anyone else who might want to know about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to just go through chronologically the process of stem cell donation um, from right from sign up through to where Alistair now is, which is two weeks sort of post donation. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's involved with it, hopefully dispel any myths along the way. Um, and I will interject now and then with a bit of science just to try and explain to you what, what's going on with a stem cell donation too. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how we're gonna go. And then at the end, obviously we'll have the Q and A for any questions you might have. Um, so first of all, I'd like to, um, I've introduced myself. I'd just like to pass it over to you, Alistair. Do you wanna introduce yourself briefly as well? Sort of your age, where you live and, and what you do in life. Yeah, for sure. Um, so hi guys, um, uh, my name's uh, Alistair Stewart, or, or Ali. Um, so I'm 30 years old, um, I live in Manchester, and I'm a co-owner of a small digital agency uh, in the Northern Quarter. And as, as Reese says, I um, just finished my uh, donation with Anthony Nolan, um, so after, after two weeks now. Um, so yeah, looking to sort of raise awareness for Anthony Nolan, um, sort of raise a little bit more awareness about sort of what the, the donation procedure entails um, and answer any questions. And show us your t-shirt there, Alistair, as well. There you go. Another perk of the job. I've got mine on as well. Uh, nice little hoodie. Nice. One of the perks of donation, a little bit of free merchandise uh, for advertising. So glad to see you. Wearing it, and um, just also as well, sign your disclaimer at the start. Uh, Alistair, I haven't offered you any money or any other services to take part in this today. You are here of your own free will and goodwill. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so we'll get into, we'll start Alistair off in a minute, but the first thing I wanted to do was just, we're gonna talk a lot about these things called stem cells. So I just wanted to quickly just go through with you what stem cells are, particularly blood stem cells. So to do that, I'm just gonna share my, desktop and a presentation I have at the moment. Okay, so we're talking about blood stem cells specifically and we're talking about a process called hematopoiesis, okay? So this is 
the formation of blood. Heme is short for iron uh, and poesis is Greek for the creation or making. So it's kind of like making iron, which is of course what, what your red blood cells carry. Um, so in the, I um, uh, just got a new participant. That's it. Um, so in the, uh, just remove that. Uh, so blood, blood development in the infants, uh, sort of less than a year old, it takes place in all the bones. Uh, when you move over to sort of adult development, um, it's mainly localised in the skull, the sternum, ribs, um, uh, the back, the vertebrae, the pelvis and the proximal ends of the femurs. So what you'll see if you look inside a bone is they're not uh, solid, um, they're hollow and inside them they've got dense cellularity, so lots of cells. And inside there is the precious marrow that we talk about. So you can see a, a cut through here kind of looks a little bit disgusting. You have the red marrow, which is where the uh, blood is produced. And then you have the yellow marrow, which is uh, basically a source of fat. It's actually quite delicious. I don't know if you've ever eaten it, Alistair, ever been to a restaurant. It is a little bit of a delicacy. I would recommend trying it. Um, you've donated it. I have, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not like that though, not looking like that. <laughs> I would recommend cooking it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so what's going on inside then? So, um, so we talk about these very special cells here, these hematopoietic blood stem cells. Um, and these are really special cells. Uh, they're incredibly rare. They're, they make up a sort of one in every 20,000 cells in the marrow. They're extremely rare. And they're capable of a number of processes. So they can either uh, be quiescent, uh, which means they're almost like asleep, they're dormant. They can undergo apoptosis, which is a form of uh, cell suicide. So if something goes wrong in the cell, it automatically triggers itself to die. They can go through a process called self-renewal, which is making an exact copy of itself, which is depicted by this arrow. And the other thing they can do is they can undergo differentiation. So this is where they mature into um, fully functional blood types. And I've put in brackets there because they don't do it that often, but the other thing they do is they can migrate. Um, so what happens normally is these stem cells take uh, sort of intermediate development decisions, going through all these intermediate stages. Don't worry about all the individual names. The important thing to remember is that they eventually become these uh, mature cells at the bottom here. And I'm sure there's a few of them which you recognize and you've seen before, such as the red blood cells, which carry oxygen around the body, platelets, which are responsible for clotting the blood. And these uh, immune cells here, these are responsible for your innate immune system and then your lymphocytes, which are important for your adaptive immunity. Um, and this has obviously been, these sorts of cells have been in the news quite a lot recently uh, in response to COVID-19. You know, we really want to see if humans have got any, uh, can develop an adaptive response to this new virus so that it will involve these sorts of cells. So uh, blood development can either go down a myeloid lineage, which is all these cells here, or it can go down a lymphoid lineage. So you can think of blood cell development as these stem cells move down through development, they, they lose the capacity to produce copies of themselves and they gain the capacity to develop into these mature cell types. So you can just see how important these stem cells are. They're almost like seeds that live inside the bone marrow and they're capable of generating the entire blood system. Um, they do this throughout the entire life of an organism as well. And there's a high output on them. So the uh, we actually produce two million red blood cells every second. So there's a high degree of output from these cells and they're really important. Um, and I can't drum that, mess, that message home enough. So um, that's just a bit of the um, science behind these stem cells. Um, hopefully when we refer to them now a bit more, you understand what we're sort of referring to. Um, so, if we start at your sort of donation journey now, uh, Ali, so sort of pre-donation, um, so when did you join the register and through which, which route did you come? So um, I think the, I think it was about 11 months ago now, uh, maybe 10, 10 or 11 months ago now that, um, that we signed up, um, came through the route of swabbing the cheek, um and sent that away so two swabs i think got sent through so did, you go to a, did you go to a donation event or was that sent through the post 
No, just just came through the came through the letterbox one day. Um, one for me and one for my wife. Um, obviously, her blood isn't special enough. Um, so yeah, it was just uh, just mine that got selected for for the donation process. Um, but yeah, just just two swabs sent away and then um, heard back um, during my honeymoon, which was September uh, last year. And I got a text message through from Anthony Nolan saying that um, someone someone needed my help essentially. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, that, that was kind of a, an interesting moment um, to, to receive that message. So I'm sure your wife was very, very chuffed that you, that took all your thoughts away from what a lovely honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were trying to hail a taxi at the time, actually. <laughs> I, was, I was too busy on, the, on my phone. Um, but uh, no, it was, it, was, um, it was an interesting moment, you know, quite sort of, sort of uh, humbling. Um, you know, when you send off your, your swabs, um, I, I kind of didn't really think that, I was going to be kind of called upon to to do the donation, um, so it was it was kind of making it very real when that that text message came through. Mm. And I guess sorry, yeah, the, the next steps from yeah. from that. Um, so I got a call, I think, from from Anthony Nolan. One of the the reps gave me a call, um, and they talked me through the process in a bit more detail. And that was um, I needed to send through some some more bloods. Um, so there was a couple of vials of blood that um, I had to send off. Um, I tried it, uh, quite a few times to get booked into the GPs, but they didn't have any um, any availability uh, for me to. Oh, really? So I ended up going next door to my neighbours, who are paramedics. Well, one's a paramedic, and one of them's a, um, a doctor. Um, and I ended up leaving there without giving them any blood because it was that much of a traumatic experience with them reading right. it on how to use the uh, how to use the actual kit to get the blood out. Um, so um, yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of needles, as um, as yeah, some of my videos on the process have, have kind of highlighted. So I just needed someone to just kind of sit me down and do it quickly rather than having to read the instructions of, of the actual vials before, before doing it. Um, but yeah, eventually um, um, my father-in-law, uh, Alan, who I think is in, in here as well, uh, he, he took my, my blood, um, sent it off, heard back again from Anthony Nolan saying that, um, yeah, there was um, myself and another donor who they were kind of moving forward into the next stages for the, for the patient. Um, and then another pack of vials came through to, to get sent off for them. Um, quite a few more vials, I think, this time. I think the first round was maybe three vials. Next round, about six, I think. And um, I took those to a friend who was a nurse. and She, she did them straight away and got those sent off. Um, and yeah, the, the next steps were into... I think it was probably actually about a month, a bit further down the line from from that final postage of, of bloods. Uh, um, I went in for a for a medical at the, the yeah. Christie Hospital in yeah. Manchester. Um, Remind, um, I, I forget now because I I also did a medical. What what it's sort of height weight, isn't it? Um, BMI. Um, no, nothing too intrusive though, from what I remember. Certainly no probes or any uh, any gloves needed putting on. It was all pretty. <laughs> Pretty, uh, yeah, I remember it being okay. It was absolutely fine. Uh, the most, the most evasive thing was uh, the COVID test. Um, so, um, yeah, I kind of went in and it was all becoming even more real. I think when you go into, um, to the hospital and you're seeing people going through chemo, um, you know, that, that sort of juxtaposition is, is a hell of a thing um, and that is just kind of reinforcement to, um, to why the, yeah, it, this needed to happen and, um, and for me to donate. Um, so, so kind of related to that then, one of my questions was going to be, you know, all the way back when you first signed up, what was it that made you join the register? Was there anything in particular? Yeah, um, so I guess over the past sort of year, um, cancer has been fairly sort of prevalent um, in, in my life and our family's life. Um, we've lost family members, we've, we've lost friends. Um, uh, one friend in particular, um, unfortunately, uh, didn't make it, but um, was involved with, with Anthony Nolan. Um, 
And it was through through that really that Anthony Neal sort of came into our into our lives, and we all sort of signed up. Um, and understanding the work that they were doing and how yeah. it sort of helped helped him and and his family, um, that's what really triggered it. And because it, there's such a direct impact that you can have on on cancer, um, you know, it just made sense to to sign up and and to to go for it. Um, so yeah, sounds like a really good reason. Um, so roughly, how long was it that you're on the register? For? before you got the call then or the text I, th I think it must have been must have been about six months I think I think it was about six months wow that's quick yeah yeah I've, I've heard it's that's fairly quick talking yeah. to several different people around um, around the process it's um, you know you hear people on it for you know five eight years before before they hear yeah, it. absolutely or, or never at all i mean the odds are stacked against you if you look at the actual odds of being called which we'll come on to in a few slides time if a horse was at that odds i mean i've made some pretty shambolic horse racing bets in my time but um you wouldn't touch a horse that had those odds but um obviously it's uh yeah it's amazing six six months that's 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 really soon yeah, I think it was yeah it was between twelve and six months. I think um, that we were on there for. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so when you initially got that text then on your honeymoon, what what was the what was the main things going through your head? I mean, did you have fears? Did you have? Were you excited, thinking, yeah, I really want to get into this, or was it just nothing? Just thought, well, this is what I signed up for. It was um, a mix between where's our taxi. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah basically sort of it becoming very very real um to to think that there was someone who needed help who was genetically matched um to me in, in such a sort of you know uh, unlikely or um i guess yeah it was just quite strange quite strange um, yeah humbling i think is 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 the word yeah absolutely um, yeah, and, and I think it's important to, to, to mention at this stage as well, if you are thinking of joining the register, that um, even at that point, you can still pull out if you want to, can't you? So say you've signed up a few years before, you were very enthusiastic about it at the time, but your circumstances change and you have second thoughts, you still have the option to withdraw at that point. There's no pressure on you from anyone to, to continue with that process, is there? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, and Anthony Nolan are very open about that fact. Um, but you can tell that you know that the process that they take you through, um, it's it's just so well choreographed. That, yeah, absolutely. That it's just they just make it incredibly easy, and all the way through from from their sort of account management team, post donation team, all of the nurses involved. You know, it's it's just a well oiled machine. Yeah, it's very, it is very good. Um, and I'll just say at this point, this, that's not the only route you can join. So if you're a regular blood donor, which is how I ended up joining, you can just tell them to take an extra tube of blood and it will go off for HLA typing. Um, and there are other, there is a student group called Marrow on campus. You can join Anthony Nolan through them. And there's also another um, bone marrow registry called DKMS, which are um, also recruiting as well. Um, so that's kind of the pre-donation questions I had, um, Alistair. I was just going to move on now to just explain this concept of HLA typing. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen again, because obviously it's so important for finding a match. Um, so you've done the cheek swab, um, Alistair. How did that go? Yeah, easy, easy. 30 seconds each side, away you go. Yeah. And then the important thing is it has to go off and be typed. So, so the whole point of that is, so say you had my immune cells um, and they come into contact with one of my own body cells. The first question that immune cell is going to ask is, is this self? You know, does this belong to me? Should, or is it a foreign body? Should I attack it? And the way it recognizes that is it reads a code on the outside of the cells, basically, which are these human leukocyte antigens. And what should happen um, if there's no immune reaction to be had, the HLA um, proteins, which is, they're actually a lot more complicated than this. This is obviously very simple um, schematic. Um, but if they match, um, 
the immune cells recognize it itself and the command is obviously just to, to leave alone. Um, but say there was some weird scenario where my cells encountered Alistair's cells. Um, can't think of how that would happen. Um, but uh, again, my immune system would, would ask the question, is this self, does this belong to me? Um, and obviously it would look at the repertoire of HLA antigens and it would see that they're very different. Um, so what would happen is the command would be no, it's a foreign body. Um, and he needs to attack and, and destroy that cell. So that's kind of the basis of, of, that's your entire immune system, basically. That's how your immune system works. So what will happen is your swab sample or your blood sample will go off to the lab. Um, and again, a simplified process here, but on chromosome six, you've got 46 chromosomes, don't forget. And on your chromosome six, you've got this region of DNA, which encodes for the human leukocyte antigen proteins and there's quite a few of them there's quite a few proteins that make up that complex um, so what they do in the lab is they try and match five of them and remember you have two copies of each gene one from your mother and one from your father um, and what we're really aiming to do when we hla type is try and obtain a 10 out of 10 match so get all of those different hla genes matching up that's obviously the aim. There's a couple of other aims as well. We're looking to check the uh, cytomegalovirus status as well. So this is a virus uh, prevalent in humans um, that normally causes them no problem at all, really. Our immune system can deal quite competently with that virus. But in immunocompromised patients, it can wreak havoc and it can be really dangerous. So it's really good to match that status. Um, the other thing that occurs is uh, they check the age of the donor. So there's good scientific evidence, medical evidence, to suggest that the younger the donor is, the higher chance there is of transplant success. That's because the stem cells that we talked about have a, a lower mutational burden, they're healthier, and they have a reduced chance of causing what's known as graft versus host disease. And I'm just gonna show you an image of that. So this is where you infuse the immune cells or the new blood system into the host and if the HLA typing isn't good enough or it's not close and the HLA the immune cells recognize foreign HLA or not a good match um, it starts to attack tissues in the body this is an example of a systemic rash in someone where the immune cells are just attacking um, areas in the skin uh, but that will be occurring all over your body where HLAs don't match so in the lining of the gut lining of the airways um, you know, it's, it's, it could be really potentially a, a debilitating condition. And you really want to limit that. And if there's good evidence that younger donors can limit the amount of uh, graft versus host disease that you get. Um, so I'm going to stop the share again then, go back. Um, so we're going to come on to now a bit more about the actual donation itself, um, Alistair. So what do you remember about the... Uh, GCSF injections which are obviously really important so this is the first thing obviously you've done your medical everything's gone fine you're a healthy guy um, you've got the all clear the medical team will be lining up the transplant date and for four days leading up to that you'll have your GCSF injections yeah so if you want to tell us a bit about I mean you're not a fan of needles you said so there must have been a little bit of uh, anxiety there I guess yeah, yeah, I'm not going to lie, there definitely was. Um, so yeah, with donation being on Monday, my, my injection started on, on Thursday. Um, and yeah, the nurse um, came around to the house um, in full PPE. Um, so there's a few um, curtains twitching in the neighbourhood, I imagine, when uh, a nurse turns up and, and full of gear. Uh, but yeah, we, it was just such a nice day. We just sat in the garden and she talked me through process, made sure uh, that I was who I said I was. Um, and um, so it's, yeah, three injections a day, um, two in one arm, one in the other, um, and then alternating. Um, and all the injections needed to be in the fridge. So the, the fridge was, was full of, um, of all these needles for, for a big amount of time. Yeah. Uh, it's separate from your beer, I take it, I hope. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, apparently the needles weren't allowed to touch anything so because they had to be in the middle of the fridge. So all beer needed to be moved to other shelves in the... In the... <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, um, it was 
as I say, it was it was over so quick. Um, the the needles weren't weren't a problem after I'd got over the initial shock of you know I'm going to be having three injections a day. Um, and yeah, I think the the, the way that was kind of um, documenting everything, um, it was a good sort of project for me to almost take my mind off off that that side of things as well. Um, the the feelings of the GCFF injections and the sort of side effects. Um, a bit sort of nausea I had um, uh, in, my, in my stomach, um, a bit like a sort of travel sickness, um, sort of seasickness kind of feeling. And then that was on the first day. Um, on the subsequent days, I started to have a sort of fluttering in my um, in my chest here, almost like a bit of an anxiety kind of kind of flutter. And then the back of my hips um, and sort of legs started to almost uh, pulse a, a little bit, I'd say. Um, felt as though yeah, I'd, I'd been in the gym, been for a run. Um, quite a strange feeling, especially sort of trying to get to sleep. Yeah, um, yeah. So an appetite kind of took a hit as well, uh, a little bit. I forget now. Do they say you can take paracetamol on them? As I can't remember. Yeah, so paracetamol only, no ibuprofen, um, because of the the blood thinning. Um, it, it has an effect on or something, something along those yeah. lines. Um, so yeah, a paracetamol, uh, I have that fairly fairly regularly, I think, just to sort of counteract that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 sort of, I sort of remember it just being sort of achy, really, rather than any intense pain, just just the feeling like you'd done something that day, whether it had been hammering a patio, digging a garden, or maybe doing a, a, a 10K or something like that. Just, just the feeling that you'd done something for me, yeah. I, I think. I don't know if you would agree with that. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, difficult, difficulty trying to relax as, as well. I found that things were always sort of pulsing or, or moving. Uh, so yeah, it was it was interesting because of the Friday, the bank holiday. Um, um, yeah, it was uh, it was interesting sort of seeing people enjoying themselves over the bank holiday, the VE day sort of holiday, yeah. and me sort of yeah pulsing. Uh, it was uh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Bit bigger fish to fry, though, I guess, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, so I was just going to provide you again with a bit of um, bit of science behind those. What's going on with those GCSF injections? I, I did actually just forget to do a, a quick slide there, um, just providing a bit of facts about stem cell donation. So there's currently uh, eight hundred thousand people on the Anthony Nolan register. This makes up about 2% uh, of the UK who are registered, which is, I think, quite average figures. I think we could do a lot better than that. Certainly Germany, Cyprus and Israel have, have higher proportions. Um, young males, interestingly, are, are a real problem. They only make up 16% of the register, but they're asked to provide over half of the donation. So there's a bit of a discrepancy there that, that needs sorting out. Um, there's good evidence that uh, donors under 30, as we've discussed, uh, you know, give stem cells, which give a higher chance of transplant success. Um, when you're registered, you have about a one in 800 chance of being called. Um, that drops to one in 200. Uh, uh, if you're a young male, 16 to 30. This is an interesting one. So about 70% of patients are able to find a tissue match. Uh, but if you're a black Asian minority ethnic group, that drops to about 20%. And that's all down to the difficulties that you can have in matching the HLA type. So really important to try and get more BAME people onto the register if possible. A few years ago at the University of Bristol, we managed to recruit someone who was half Dutch, half Pakistani, which is obviously a fantastic resource to have on the register and is exactly the type of um, genotypes that you need. Um, but lots of, uh, lots of effort needs to be directed towards that kind of recruitment. Um, about 90% of donations take place through peripheral blood stem cell collection, which we're uh, talking about now. Um, about 10% of people aren't able to mobilize enough stem cells, so it's done through bone marrow collection, where they go into the actual bone itself to extract the marrow. Um, and just a little point here that it costs about £40 for each, um, each person to be added to the register through the HLA typing, the various administrative um, things that have to be done. So always worth donating if you can. So just coming back to this GCSF then, because people might be a bit scared about what's going on when that needle goes into your arm. So if we go back to this diagram of the bone here and we take a closer look about what's going on, 
we can see we've got these stem cells and they live in what's known as these bone marrow niches or uh, HSC niches. They're supported by a layer of stromal cells which bathe them in nutrients and there are signals to help them grow and maintain themselves. Um, and remember what I said, they're incredibly rare. So the good thing that GCSF does is when you inject it is it finds its way to the bone marrow and these cells almost duplicate themselves. So they increase the total number of stem cells which are in the bone marrow. And because it increases the white cell number, that's thought to be part of the reason why you experience a little bit of bone pain during those injections. Um, well, that's not all it does. So the other interesting thing it does is, so we're just gonna, again, zoom in on that um, stem cell niche. Um, and what happens is that supportive layer of stromal cells in the bone marrow secretes a molecule called CXCL12. And I want you to remember that, especially for tomorrow's session on receiving um, a stem cell donation. Um, and the stem cells have a molecule on their surface called CXCR4, and that helps to almost anchor the stem cells in place to let them know that they're in the correct location. And another interesting thing which this GCSF does is it comes along and it interferes with the interaction of those molecules. So it cuts them and then this allows the stem cells to mobilize themselves into the peripheral blood. Now this is somewhere normally they, they, they hardly ever circulate in peripheral blood. You know, if you were to take a blood sample, you'd, you'd see almost none of them there. So that combined action of GCSF helps to increase the number and then release them into uh, peripheral circulation. So I'm going to stop my share there and go back to Alistair. So um, another myth I just wanted to dispel is that with the stem cells, obviously you might be worried, does it take all of them? No, it doesn't take all of them. Um, and your stem cells and your blood system completely replenishes itself within two to four weeks. So no lasting effects at all really on, on your personal health. So once you've done the GCSF injections, Alistair, where, where was your actual, where was your donation? Uh, so that was in, uh, in Manchester um, at the Christie Hospital. Um, just uh, just South Manchester. Um, so yeah, um, interesting to kind of go into a hospital and uh, during the sort of COVID time, yeah. and the, the process or the the procedures that have got in place to um, to kind of get you into the hospital was um, yeah, kind of kind of weird. Um, you your Skeletor type mask that you had on as well to get to the uh, to get to the hospital. Yeah, that's been a butt of many jokes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I just wanted to take every precaution. It probably wasn't wasn't necessary, seeing as uh, my wife dropped me up in, in the car. Um, but yeah, just going through the sort of the hospital, I had my temperature checked sort of maybe three times before I actually got to the ward. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, do you want me to go into sort of the, the next sort of stages of my um, donation? <laughs> I mean, just to hold it, I mean, these are the things I just wanted to get across. So your, your transport was all paid for, mm -hmm. all ex they, you know, well, it was all really claimable. Um, there's three main centres in the UK, London, Manchester and Sheffield. If you're not near those centres, the important thing to say is that anti Nola lay on all the travel. Um, they cover any overnight stay that you might need in a hotel. And the other thing that's important to, I think, address now is anyone who's worried about not going on the register because of loss of earnings. Anti Nolan covers things like that as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, once you've once you've got there, which didn't seem much of a problem, um, crack. How was the donation? Crack away. Yeah, yeah, um, fine, fine. Uh, so arrived uh, arrived about twenty minutes early. So I was sat outside the ward just waiting for them to open. Um, but yeah, when I was in there, um, led straight into the donation room where um, there were. I think there were four different chairs or, or donation chairs, pumps, I think they call them. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there was only myself and another donor in there uh, who was giving a sibling donation. Um, and there was people kind of coming in and out um, of the other two chairs. Um, but I was in there, had to sign a, a bit more paperwork, um, COVID test before I got, um, got the donation underway. Yeah, I mean, this, is the, this would be the major difference between say my donation and yours. I mean, all those extra protective steps right now. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, really, it's, it'd be interesting to, to experience it outside of a, of a pandemic because 
I couldn't tell you what my nurses looked like because they yeah, were, it's a shame losing that interaction. Yeah, uh, but don't get me wrong, they were they were absolutely fantastic. Um, they they made it an absolute breeze, and just just having a laugh with them just made four and a half hours seem like half an hour. Um, but in terms of the donation, hooked me up to to the machines. Um, one needle in in this arm, in the crook of my arm, um, and another one, a cannula, um, just in the, the top of my hand there. Um, uh, so yeah, blood blood out of this one, and then back in back into this one. Yeah, quite a clever little machine, isn't it? it it's um, yeah. quite quiet as well for what it does. I mean, it's just in the corner there. You're blood goes into it it takes everything it needs and then puts the rest back it's a uh, it's quite nice that sounded like a washing machine on spin cycle um, i found oh really i don't remember it being that loud yeah yeah we must have had the older models you, you must have <laughs> yeah you're up north they they just put any old <laughs> clapped out machine up there <laughs> how do i leave this <laughs> 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 no, no, it was um, it was it was strange. One of the the, the vibration of the machine. Um, one of the the things that the nurses said was, if you start to feel the vibrations um, or feel as though the vibrations are sort of penetrating you a little bit, it can be a sign that your um, calcium is quite deficient, or you, you're deficient of calcium. Okay. Um, and I noticed that sort of partway through the, the donation process. So I had to chew on some calcium um, pills for, for a while. And I think oh. I had an injection of, of calcium through the cannula as well, just to, um, just to sort of sort that. Apparently that's quite a common thing, yeah. for, um, being on one of the pumps. So how long did it last, roughly? Uh, about four and a half hours, four, four, four and a half. Um, right, yeah. I mean, it, I remember it just, I mean, I was, during it, I felt very comfortable. I, I had to move every sort of 45 minutes just to, you know, it's the sweating that was a problem for me on the back. Um, but just being showered with tea, biscuits, um, any food I wanted, any request, it was just, uh, you really were treated like a king as far as I remember. Yeah. Yeah, I would, uh, I would mirror that, I think. Um, yeah, I was, it was just basically being sat, sat at home, really, but with the yeah. of just having a machine filtering my blood. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say you could fall asleep because um, you no. got, obviously, the noise and the environment. And like you said, you do get reminded now and then that you have a needle in your arm if you move too quickly. Yeah, yeah, I made that mistake. Um, I had a work call uh, on my laptop. Laptop was just sat in front of me on the table and you just kind of forget that you, you're in the hospital with a few needles in you. Um, so yeah, just flexed my arm ever so slightly and was yeah very much reminded of where I was quite quick. <laughs> so at the end of the donation, um, kind of all finishes. Um, it's quite weird seeing your own bag fill up, isn't it? Did you find that? Yeah, I was I was really interested by it actually. Uh, I asked the the nurse to sort of talk me through what was happening with with the machine and um, and how the the, the centrifuge was pushing out the, my blood and, and filtering it out. Um, so yeah, I was, I was really interested in looking at my bag. I'm looking over here like it's still there, but it's... it's yeah, I mean, uh, you get the classic photo at the end with your bag and um, my mates confused it. Every time I show them, they go, oh, it's, it looks like a colostomy bag because it's slightly brown. You have to remind them that it's actually a stem, stem cell bag. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. It's um. It's a shame as well that you didn't get the overnight stay at the hotel. That's that's quite nice, I guess, because you live on the doorstep. It wasn't a problem, so they could just at the end they let you know, did they, that um, everything was okay and you don't manage to donate enough. Yeah, so I think it was about two hours in. They they can take a reading from the machine, and they were getting a, a fairly good estimate that I wasn't going to be needed for for the second day. I guess that's a point worth worth making that. If you don't give enough stem cells in that first donation day, then you you have to or you you're asked to come in for the, the second day to to kind of top that number up. Um, so yeah, they, they told me um, or confirmed about four o'clock, um, and on the same day that I wasn't needed to, to come back in for the second donation because I've given enough. Fantastic. Um, and of course, if they can't get enough on the second day, that's when they have to consider putting you under a mild general anaesthetic and um, actually going directly into the bone. 
um, which is a slightly more invasive procedure, obviously. Um, I have watched a younger brother go through that and it actually didn't cause that much of a problem. You know, he had a slight limp the next day, but really, again, you couldn't say that it was a, a particularly drastic procedure at all that, that left you bed bound for ages. It is, again, would, would go down as a fairly minor medical procedure, I think. Um, so nothing to be scared of there. Um, yeah, um, so it was a shame you didn't get the overnight stay as well because I, I don't know about you, but because I've got a wife and kids at home, um, you know, being put up for the night was really nice. You know, Auntie Nolan giving you sort of bed and breakfast. You really missed out on that. Um, I, I, you know, I would do it every week if I could. Um, people kept saying to me, oh, you poor thing coming by yourself. I said, no, it's absolutely fine. You know, I, I, I could have been donating teeth without anaesthetic being extracted by a rusty spoon. And I still would have just, just, just for that overnight hotel stay was just, Fantastic. Um, maybe the second time I donate. <laughs> <laughs> so post donation now, what, what are you now? Um, coming up to two weeks? Yeah, so tomorrow, tomorrow will be two weeks. Um, so yeah, yeah, Monday. Yeah, it'll be two weeks on Monday. So how are you, how are you feeling now? Fine, fine. I, to be honest, I felt fine. Um, when I got home from, from the donation. Um, yeah. As soon as I got off the phone to, uh, to the nurse saying that I'd given enough, I, uh, I poured myself a glass of wine and yeah, it was, it was absolutely fine. I was at work the next day. Um, yeah, I can't say that I've, I've had any sort of side effects after, after the donation at all. That's good. So that's another important myth to dispel, isn't it? That people think if you go through this, oh, I'm going to have to have a week off work recovering or it's really painful. I won't be able to do my job. Um, I would say at most, I mean, I, again, I was back to normal activity the next day. Um, and I don't envisage it causing problems for, for most people, really. Mm -hmm. I guess if they had to go into the marrow to get it directly, you might be thinking about having a touch longer off, but um, certainly not a reason to to be, you know, not joining, I think. Um, I think I'm thinking, uh, they, they recommend maybe taking the next day off if you're if you're donating as I did, and if it's if it's through the more invasive uh, method. Yeah, a few days off, I think. But, you know, it's I didn't feel as though I needed a day off after after that. Yeah, and and, and again, if you have any loss of earnings, you can put in your expense claims. Um, which, to be honest, I, I didn't, and I remember speaking to you, you said you didn't really do either. So a lot of people are happy to do this. But if you are learning, if you are losing a considerable amount of money, you know, that is reclaimable. Um, so interestingly, do you know any details of your recipient? Obviously, we're in an, an, a non-amenity period now, aren't we, for two years, where you're not allowed to know any details. But they do sometimes tell you the sex or where they live. Did, did you get any information? Yeah, um, minimal information. Um, so all I know is that um, my recipient is a male adult. Um, that's that's all I know. Okay, no indication of age or, or where they might be. No, no, um, no. That's that's all I know. Oh, interesting. Um, mine was a female recipient, which I always find quite interesting because that means there is a, a female walking around somewhere now with a, a male, predominantly male, blood system in there somewhere. Um, which I always find fascinating and a little bit worrying at the same time, you know, if they were to commit any crimes, any murders and her blood was there, I'd be in all sorts of trouble. Um, but uh, yeah. And the other interesting thing is whether they take on your sort of immunity. So um, you know, I have hay fever and allergy to cats. I wonder if, you know, that that's causing her problems now. I did, I did quickly read a, a study just before we came on here and apparently it's been known that peanut allergies can be transferred. So I don't know how you are with nuts, uh, Alistair. Is everything okay? Yeah, no, no allergies. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting to hear that. Um, so the nurse who gave us the GCSF injections, um, she was talking about one of her um, other experiences with a with a donor and how during a second donation, which I know is, is quite rare to to do. Um, having found out who his recipient was and, and having quite strong communication with them, um, that it not only helped solve his, his blood disorder with his donation, but also helped him grow his hair back. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I thought that was a, 
an interesting, uh, an interesting little story. Wow. Incredible. <laughs> um, so once these two years have passed then, you pass the anonymized period, um, do you think you'd want to make contact with your recipient? Would you, I mean, obviously you've signed some documents already to say if, if you'd be happy for them to make contact, but is, there, is that something that interests you? Yeah, I've already I've already sent a message through Anthony Nolan um, just to just to say I hope everything goes well. Um, you know, just sending you all sort of the positivity in the world and, and um, yeah, just fingers crossed for for everything. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd I'd love to hear from them. Uh, absolutely, um, yeah, for sure. But it's it's very much you know balls in their court. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind either way. So. Again, just to get you thinking a bit as well. So if it was, um, obviously you've, you've got the option to get updates on how the patient is doing. If say it was the other way around, so it was a negative outcome, how would you, is that, is that something you'd want to know or would you rather that was, you'd rather not know about that? Obviously you don't really get the choice when you ask, but yeah. what, how do you think you'd react? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, I wouldn't mind either way. I think it would be very much again if it would be the recipient. Uh, if it was a positive reaction, it'd be the recipient to, to reach out if they wanted to. If it was a negative, then I would have thought it would then fall to the family to make the decision if they wanted to to reach out. Yeah. So I think you know either way, it's 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 not up to me. I've done everything I can do. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind either way. I think that's the important thing to say here as well is that very often people can say oh, I'm going to save a life I mean you're not really doing that you're just simply offering someone a second chance you know there's all sorts of reasons why something might not work it's not your fault it's out of your control um, but what you are doing is just giving someone just another chance of getting through what, whatever illness they have um, so I guess my last question to you would be um, Obviously, if you could do it again, would, would you do it? Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Absolutely. Uh, for, for the level of effort that is required from, from me, um, you know, it's, the potential is, is incredible. Yeah. Uh, it's an absolute privilege. Uh, as, as you've said uh, to me in previous conversations, I think that's the right word for it. It's a, it's a privilege to, to be able to, to do it. Um, and it's I a privilege ask. and it's an embarrassment as well, uh, Alistair, because people shower you with praise to say you're a hero. And it is just a glorified blood donation. You're sat in a bed, slightly more complicated machinery, slightly longer, but that's all you're really doing and everything replenishes itself in a, you know, within a month. So it's, you know, there are some embarrassing terms thrown around. I mean, I'll take them. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it really is quite simple, I think. And you, there is a chance you could be recalled for this same patient, isn't there? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's for the, the lymphocyte. Uh, right, yeah. yeah. Um, so ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, just, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. Yeah, fantastic. And obviously you get the free merchandise as well, which is great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's really... You know, we're coming up to an hour now, so that's all I wanted to cover, really. Um, just try and give people an idea of, of how simple it is. Um, just if anyone who's currently on the call, if there's anyone has any questions at all they'd like to ask Alistair or myself, there's one already here from Trudy. Is that that's your mum, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, any medical conditions which are contraindications for being a donor? There is a whole list of them, actually. And if you go to Anson Nolan's website, they list all of them. It's quite an extensive list. So they are after the very sort of healthiest people. Uh, I think being treated for a previous cancer, a previous leukemia, having certain, being positive for certain viruses, having autoimmune conditions, obviously automatically rules people out. Um, so anyone who is interested can go to those uh, anti Nolan pages and there's quite a nice list there of, of you know, what you can, who, who can and who can't um, donate. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, there's on the bottom of this Zoom call, there's a chat bar. Feel free to ask anything. Uh, we'll do our best to answer anything. Um, yeah.
obviously we've got Julia with us there as well. Um, age limit for donors. Um, so the lower limit is um, 16. The upper limit varies with whatever register you choose to sign up to. So um, uh, I've got a slide here, which I'll just quickly share with you. Um, because it is related to that question. So the bone, British Bone Marrow Registry will take you on from 17 to 40. Uh, DKMS will take you on from 17 to 55. There is uh, one um, indication here is that you're over seven stone 12 pounds, which I can tell you for me under lockdown is not a problem right now. Um, and Anthony Nolan will take you from 16 to 30. Again, I've put these links on, there are various exclusion criteria as well. Um, and they're also, if you're on a university campus, you have these marrow groups. We have Brighton and Sussex Marrow, obviously at the University of Sussex, and they do recruitment drives or events uh, at various times through the academic year. How that's gonna be affected going forward into next academic year, I don't know, but there are, a, as you can see, a, a, a number of different ways that you can join. Um, this is an interesting question from Dan. Um, has the law changed regarding opt-out helped with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation? Um, it hasn't, unfortunately. So that only refers to um, sort of organs, solid organs. Um, hasn't really helped with stem cell transplant at all. We talked about this, didn't we, Alistair, on the, um, on the phone in the week. And I, I really, I think it would be fantastic if you could get to a position where people are HLA typed at birth. So when, you know, when new ba babies are born, they get that heel prick and they go off for very, various sort of um, genetic tests to see if they're carrying certain genes. I just don't see why you couldn't do a, a little HLA type at birth and possibly end up with a situation where, uh, you know, someone could get a letter later on in life saying that, you know, you're a positive HLA type match for someone who's in need. And I do think the majority of people would, would take that letter quite seriously and would consider doing it. I think part of the problem more people do it is they're just not aware of how easy it is that these registers exist. Um, but I think, yeah, if we could get to that kind of opt out style thing that um, solid organ donation has gone to, I think that'd be fantastic. But I've had these conversations with lead in transplant consultants and I'm led to believe that ethically, morally, it would be a very difficult thing to do, <coughs> um, which I don't know what you think about that, Alistair. I, I think there's bigger, bigger issues at stake really I think than pe you know, people being pressured or feeling emotionally tied up with it. Um, no, yeah. I think it sounds like a, an interesting idea. Um, yeah, and you still have the decision I guess to, That's right, yeah. so you know, why not, why not raise the question to see if it, it's, it's something that a, a donor would want to go through with. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Exactly, um, question from Ursula. How could you increase the percentage of male donors? Is there a possibility of making blood or stem cell donation an opt-out system in the UK rather than opt-in? Again, that's just what we've been talking about, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be an easy way out of it. At the moment, you can't do anything than sort of campaign and try and... I mean, I, I think it's important. You don't want to sort of alienate females. <laughs> you know, you don't want to say it's all about males because obviously female donation is really important. But um, I guess all you can do is just keep campaigning and trying to get the message out there really um i think so this is from rachel's iphone um i think most people confuse stem and bone cell transplants how can we end this confusion um that's a good one rachel i don't i'm not at all familiar with what bone cell transplants are um but i can see why that would cause confusion for people um i don't know maybe you should start that campaign rachel of um, avoiding confusion between those two different types. Uh, yeah, I think from our perspective, it's important to sort of discriminate to actually say hematopoietic stem cell transplantation rather than actual bone cells, which are a, a very different thing to a, a blood stem cell. Could this be, in, is this a question around the confusion between the two different processes of extraction of, of stem cells? I don't know, Rachel. Could you would you be able to elaborate on that? There we go. Bone marrow and stem cell. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's um, that's 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 quite a tricky one, actually. I think we probably need to be a lot more consistent with our language because I don't know about you. Uh, so I, I hear it 
flip between those terms quite a lot. Yeah, 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 massively, massively. So, bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant, HSC transplant. There's various terms for it, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for you, um, do you, does it cause you more concern when you hear stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant? What, what? I, I connect bone marrow with, and this, this might just be me personally, but um, the bone marrow being the more invasive procedure. Um, yeah. Stem cell being the one that, that I went through. Um, but yeah, you're right. And even during the donation process, the, the nurses were flicking between talking about bone marrow and, and stem cell all the time. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good idea, Rachel, actually. That's perhaps something that uh, we do need to work on a little bit is, is the consistency of the language there. Um, so from Dan, we've got a university students in the ideal age group and they're most likely to have time and inclination to donate, absolutely. Um, thank you for doing this out of Sussex. Yeah, and, and you know, I don't want to make it all about the University of Sussex um, and all about universities. There's loads of people who don't go to university who should be on these registers. Um, but obviously, universities are ripe hunting grounds because of what you just said, Dan. Um, and, you know, Mario do a fantastic job up and down the country. And I should just quickly plug this event um, that is going on in the next... Uh, it's being launched by Anthony Nolan. It was either last week or this week. They're doing the Lockdown Lifesaver Challenge. So with COVID-19, potential recruits have dropped, number of donations have dropped. Um, so it's really about keeping this message going because even though there's more COVID around, there's not any less sort of cancer problems or people needing transplants. So the real aim, go away and read about this. You can see the links here. Um, but I think the real aim of this is just trying to share as much as you can on social media. Just try and bomb your various WhatsApp groups with um, the links to join in these registers and really spreading the word about how easy it is. Um, but while I'm here on this slide, I'll just plug tomorrow's event. So um, today's all been through the donation perspective with Alistair, but tomorrow we've got really, well, it's not a nice story, is it? It's, uh, it's a horrible story of a uh, a student at the University of Sussex, Julia, who's I believe is on the call, um, and talk about her uh, experience of actually receiving a stem cell transplant, which I think will be uh, really interesting. Um, Julia is here. Do you want to quickly give us a wave, Julia? Can you switch your video on? Ah, uh, there she is. Say, say hello. Oh, I have to unmute you, don't I? Um, hang on, hang on, hang on. Try. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you, Alistair, for doing this. It's been so interesting listening. Oh, I'm looking forward yeah, to good today. stuff. Yeah, very much looking forward to tomorrow. Say that again, Alistair. You broke up a little bit there. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, looking, looking forward to, uh, to hearing the other side of the story tomorrow. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so... There's a final question here from Rachel. How can we help to spread the word and get more people on the register? Well, I think that sort of lockdown challenge might help. Just keep talking to people about it. Keep spreading, keep dispelling these myths that it hurts, that it leaves lasting damage, that you could get loss of earnings, loss of time. And I think, you know, those are the real sort of key messages to, to try and get across. Um, so I really, I'm aware that I've taken an hour of your precious bank holiday Sundays. I'm going to take another hour of it tomorrow. So I think we'll just wrap things up there. Um, but I just want to say thank you to, for everyone for joining. Thank you, Alistair, for um, obviously being a donor and blogging the event on Twitter, you know, giving the process much more publicity, making people aware of what, what goes on. Um, I think that's really good. Um, and Thanks a lot for tonight and just sharing your experience. Ah, oh, pleasure. Um, no, anything to raise awareness. Um, um, yeah, I'd be more than happy to be involved with. Yeah, we'll, um, this session is recorded. Um, so we'll be um, doing a bit of editing on it and then uploading it. Anyone who missed it will get a chance to watch it. And hopefully we can um, spread the message just on how easy it is um, and you know what it can potentially do for someone. So. Uh, Thank you all for being in attendance tonight. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your bank holidays. See you tomorrow if you're joining for Julius, Julius' session.
Um, and yeah, I'll hopefully speak to you again, Alistair. Yeah, definitely. Take care. <laughs> See you later, guys. Bye.